Klim. And today we've got Drew Stooley with us, who is our resident expert on uh, driver feedback signs. So we're going to talk about the things like how to install them and what we're doing on the driver feedback sign market, which is um, mainly uh, the integration side. We don't make our own driver feedback signs and never will, but we work with a number of different partners and we're going to talk about how you can integrate to those different partners. Drew, what are the kinds of signs that we can connect to? Uh, right now we've uh, integrated with uh, Carmana Speed Check 15s. Uh, we've got integration with Traficom, and then uh, we've got RU2 on there as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, Carmana bought another company called? Right, Carmana bought IDC, who okay. originally was making, and unfortunately for Carmana, we still reference them as IDC signs, the, the ones in the field. Uh, but Carmana have come around and they've renamed it and rebranded it as the Speed Check 15. And I think they have another sign. Okay, okay, so, so we're gonna be talking about a couple of different signs that we have. What I thought I would do is I'm going to go in and run a short little presentation to take you guys through uh, a couple of things about the, um, uh, the, the signs. But before that, I just wanna check up with um, Jessica to see if there's anything we need to know about before, the, uh, before, the, before we start. I'm coming to you live from my kitchen, y'all. Um, but just as always, a couple of housekeeping things. We will be doing um, Q and A uh, at the end. So if you guys want to submit any questions, um, instead of using the chat feature, there's a specific Q and A um, icon if you go to the bottom of your control screen. And uh, we will stop Peter at the end and get some questions for Drew and Peter there. Um, and if you need anything else, you can put it in the chat. I saw that someone was having trouble with audio, so we did put in the dial-in um, number in the chat as well. That's Thanks it. very much, Jessica. All right, I'm gonna stop my video and share my screen. All righty, so. What I'm going to do is just go over a couple of different things here. And, excuse me. So just a little bit of you know, applied information, information about us. Uh, we deployed now in 590 cities uh, with over 17,000 devices deployed. And we're not a big company, but we're not a small company either. We've got about 75 employees. And we always go direct. Uh, in other words, we, uh, sorry, we always go through our distributors uh, to the market and we're the technology company behind it. So we don't sell anything. We don't have salespeople on the ground or anything like that. We're the technology company behind all of those, uh, all of those companies that represent our products. There's a couple of core product lines that we do, which is connected school beacons, connected driver feedback signs and connected pedestrian crossings. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on today. We also do connected traffic signal controllers that's providing information in terms of uh, getting cellular communication on a traffic signal controller. Uh, at the same time with the, the traffic signal controllers, we do emergency vehicle preemption uh, with that same hardware and uh, bus priority. And then all of our devices connect back into our connected vehicle platform uh, called Travel Safely, which we can do messages over the cellular network to a smartphone app or direct to cars doing uh, over CB2X or DSRC as well. But as I said, today we're going to talk about driver feedback signs. So what are driver feedback signs a little bit? I'm not going to go into too much of that, but I do want to go into some of the best practices. So what we do is we wirelessly monitor and control radar feedback signs. What do we mean by that? Well, sometimes, like on that picture before, we've got a radar feedback sign in a school zone with flashes. So you actually have to uh, set up a schedule of when the beacons are turning on and off and when you're changing the driver feedback um, speeds uh, in the signs. We're able to detect lamp failures. It's quite simple to install these devices as well. 
Um, I'm going to explain how we do that in the field with Druze. Um, and then we also pull back a whole bunch of information from the science. So we're pulling back the median speed, 85th percentile, 95th percentile, and we're grabbing the volume. Um, I will also say on the volume side, remember these aren't, um, you know, uh, tens of thousands of dollar uh, devices with very expensive radars. The volume is, um, is a good indication, but it's, I wouldn't take it as an accurate counting system. Monitoring the AC voltage, solar and battery backup. So we are actually able to tell, tell you when the batteries are going to fail and also when they're power failure events and so on. So the device that we have out there um, can basically back all this information, but also on the radar feedback sign, we can configure information. So the steady speed, when the sign starts flashing, um, and, and you know maximum speed and things like that, so that you can remotely control these signs, and you can also remotely control dynamically changing the speed limits. And we'll go into that in, in, in a second. So what we do is, obviously the devices uh, include um, a cellular mode in all of our devices, a connectivity and support plan, uh, GLAN software, and a complete warranty. So we warrant you know, these uh, devices for the period of time that you have a connectivity and support plan. And what that means is we'll actually upgrade the cell modems for you for free um, and we guarantee cellular connectivity. It obviously easily retrofits into existing radars and uh, other beacon hardware. And the whole idea behind this is to reduce the, the, the downtime and improve the response times on fixing these things. So, you know, one of the things that came out of uh, Gwinnett County when they installed it, they saw a 90% reduction in calls related to the operation of their school beacons. And that's because they knew about the problems before uh, anyone in the public did. And also their beacons were turning on and off at the right times. Now, you know, a lot of people uh, have got school beacons, a mix of school beacons, driver feedback signs, pedestrian crosswalks. So all of this collects back into the same glance central system. So what we're doing is this device, which is our AI 500-070 unit, which is a, a flasher control unit, um, is able to get installed in the school zones and obviously school zones, you know, um, reduce the speed uh, basically of, of cars driving along. And the whole idea is what we want to do is we're, we're trying to reduce the speed of vehicles so that if there is an impact with a pedestrian, it's far less likely, you know, if a vehicle is driving more than 40 miles an hour, the chances of someone surviving is one in 10. If he's driving less than 20 miles an hour, the chances of a pedestrian surviving are nine in 10. So it's a dramatic difference if we can slow down these vehicles because we really are gonna be saving lives. The other area here that we're talking about mainly today is driver feedback signs. Um, and you know we've seen that they can slow down drivers by five to nine miles per hour. So it's a huge amount. Um, and you know, when you see that sign, you see what your speed is, people recognize it, um, and they generally slow down their speed when they are speeding. This gives you a little bit of a view of what it looks like in the Glan central system. Uh, you know, you'll see some school beacons over here, and these are just general school beacons. You'll see over here, school beacons with driver feedback signs, and also just standard driver feedback signs. So this is in Tampa, Florida, where they have you know, various different uh, configurations of these different devices, depending on either legacy or also you know, new devices and, and areas of where they're trying to slow down vehicles. I wanted to go over just a little bit about this because when I, when I was um, sending out the email for this, I had a couple of people follow up with me and say, listen, can you please just remind people about MUTCD guidelines? Okay, and, and interesting enough, 
I'm not in the radar feedback sign business. And, and I learned something by going through this. So I wanted to share this with everybody. Um, so really important is the color, generally speaking, of a radar feedback sign. According to MUTCD, it should be a yellow background sign because it is a warning sign, not a regulatory sign. This sign over here is regulatory. So it is allowed to be white. Now, every single state has got their own practices. Every single city has their own practices. This is just what MUTCD says. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other, <coughs> excuse me, other items on MUTCD uh, that we can talk about in terms of, you know, it has to be six feet above the ground and things like that. I'm not going to go over all the details of that. What I will go over is when you're in an area where the speed limit is 45 miles an hour or less, you MUTCD recommends 12 inches or bigger most cities select a larger sign, which is about a 15 inch sign um, for 45 miles an hour or less. What we found is whenever you over 45 miles an hour, it's recommended you use an 18 inch um, sign. So it's just based on speed, um, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of what you're going to see here. Now, one of the things we notice, and this is just, um, you know, from deployments and, and monitoring information and things like that is also, please remember, uh, if you're looking at having these signs give you um, volume information, it gives you a great indication, especially when you're on a single lane roadway, when you're on dual lane or even three lanes, remember these radars aren't tracking multiple lanes, generally speaking. In other words, majority of them are tracking just the single vehicle and providing information on the speed of that single vehicle. There can be some more advanced radars and things like that, but that's just to remember that it gives you a great indication, but when you're doing larger um, roadways, it, it's not gonna be the same as you know deploying a $10,000 radar in the roadway, of course. One of the other items um, is what messages are acceptable. Obviously, you should be using uppercase letters, a black background, and yellow digits over here. Um, and it is MUTCD does approve having a slowdown message. They don't approve the sad faces and the strobe beacons. Now, that being said, Every single jurisdiction has their own implementation. This is just MUTCD guidelines. Now, one of the things we've also looked at is one, the items you're able to configure in these signs is generally the steady speed, which is what speed you start showing what the speed of the driver is. So if you've got a 45 mile an hour speed limit, generally from about 30 to 45 miles an hour, you show their steady speed. Then flashing speed is it flashes the speed of the, uh, of the driver. And that obviously is from 46 miles an hour to 49 miles an hour. Then when you start showing the slowdown speed over here is from 50 miles an hour to 55, and it would say slow down 51, slow down 52, slow down. So it flashes slow down with the speed of the driver. Then there's another setting called max speed, which is what speed you stop displaying the speed of the driver. And it will only say slow down. And this is for when you have drivers that are um, <laughs> doing the, the speeding, uh, basically driving along and uh, going and trying to see how fast they can drive. You don't want them to see 65, 70, in a 45 mile an hour speed limit area. So it's just, these are some of the best practices. Now, all of this is configurable from our system. And we'll go and jump into the Glance platform a little bit later showing some of that. Some of the reports that we're doing, uh, we collecting all the median 85th percentile, 95th percentile and volume of the vehicle on a daily average. And then we can look at the median speed uh, of that device 
And you can see on the heat map where people are speeding. And we see generally speaking, people speed around here at 1 a.m. to basically four or five o'clock a.m. in the morning when there's not very many vehicles on the roadways. And it's the, the speed is the least from seven o'clock to um, one o'clock. Now, when you look at the volume of vehicles, we can see at this particular device that it's mainly from seven o'clock all the way to eight o'clock. This is a, um, you know, where they're getting around about 169, 201 vehicles per hour. So it's not a very busy road that I've selected here. And you'll see on the weekends, it drops down. So it's a great way of seeing how traffic is. Now, often you'll see on, the, uh, on certain school zone areas that it'll have a AM peak or a, a PM peak uh, where the people are driving in that particular direction along that roadway. We also look at information in terms of um, your battery health. So you can see over here that there's a battery over here that's in fair condition. Um, that's about to fail, but we've actually got a battery here that is actually failing. It's showing bad. It's dropping below 11.45 volts on a daily basis. And what we do is we look at the information for the last three days and provide a recommendation here of whether or not you should replace a battery. I'm going to go and stop my screen share. I'm going to come back into the video here. And Bruce and I are going to jump into the seats. Um, Bruce, is there some of the stuff that I've missed there before we go running around and um, looking at you know one of the actual installations behind us? Uh, no, that, that's a that was an excellent overview. Um, some people have different terms, so that you know, but most of what we saw in there is you know what we deal with, and a lot of that is the data that lets you access and, and see what's going on. Uh, the, the heat maps are perfect because a lot of times we hear the municipalities, the police know where to sit when. Because for some reason on the third Tuesday of every month, this one guy's always late going for a graveyard shift or coming off graveyard shift so they know to get him. Uh, but it's a great use of the data to see what's going on and understand uh, the dynamics of the traffic flow in the city. Primary, what kind of um faults do we see happening most often on a driver feedback sign that people experience once they've installed it and everything's working what kind of things normally come back um usually it's power issues uh ac not so much but they'll lose ac so they'll lose comms not be getting any data uh as peter pointed out in the report you can tell when you have solar batteries are starting to, to get low uh, and they need uh, maintenance or replacing uh, occasionally, you have issues where uh, the radar and the beacon stop talking. Uh, we've got things in place to stop that. We have a half hour check that if we don't get data, we kind of reinitialize the handshake uh, so we can start getting data back from it. But sometimes they just get so out of sync that they kind of just need to be both power cycled and brought back, back together at the same time. And, and I suppose those are things that we've learned over the last three, four years of integrating to all these different radar feedback signs to know what's happening in the live data. You know, one of the things we do know is often late at night we receive no data because there are no vehicles driving along the roadway. And you'll see the data. And the first time we saw that, we thought something was broken, but um, it wasn't. And then you find that there's just no vehicles. And, you know, because some of the times you, they place these uh, in roadways which are quite quiet uh, residential roadways. Yeah, the, the best example, the one almost everybody always hears about is Marietta, and Marietta's really big on speeding, and they've actually put a lot of these in the subdivisions. So even when we were putting some of these in and testing, we'd get up on the ladder, put it in, make sure it was all working, then get in our car to drive to generate some traffic, because for 15, 20 minutes, you're not seeing anybody drive, because right? everybody's gotten to work, and everybody else is just sitting in it. Home, so. so when we do an installation, um, how do you actually confirm it's working? Uh, the first thing to do is, is that you will get notification in level three uh, of the device and glance that there is a radar connection successful message in the error log. 
uh, and you know that because it's the same sequence of seeing the, the type of modem and the cell strength, uh, you'll usually see a hard reset or some kind of message like that. Uh, once you see that, you know that electrically everything is good. Uh, the next time you're going to see anything is, is we post every 15 minutes radar data. Uh, if for some reason the device posts between that for something, a uh, cabinet door or whatever, it's going to post the same data. It's not generating, it's not going to post what it's accumulated. No, it only posts new data so, every 15 minutes. So we're doing what's called a 15 minute bin of all the data. So we collect the information over a 15 minute period. Correct. And we do it, what is the data that we actually collect? Uh, the data we're collecting is, as you said, the median speed, the 85th percentile, 95th percentile, and the volume. Okay, and, and one of the things I know that there's some setup that can be done is on the volume that you can configure. Because we were talking about, um, Sometimes it's not perfectly accurate. Well, yeah, and, and you know, the, the radar is picking up speed changes. So the same car can actually trigger four or five different because they get caught speeding, they slow down, it's still flashing. So now they slow down a little more and that's gonna trigger another instance in the radar. Uh, so we have built-in fudge factors that are actually customizable per device to compensate for, you know, uh, we know with this type of radar, we usually put a fudge factor in here so you're not getting, you know, a, a thousand hits for 10 cars. Mm. Uh, and the, the beacon is doing the math and adjusting that and then sending it back. So uh, I think we've had a couple instances where it's always kind of red high. So we've kind of, you know, changed the fudge factor to bring it back down to the tech reporter. They saw 20 cars in the past 15 minutes and it's reading 100. So we'll modify it and it'll be more accurate. That also depends on the roadway geometry from what I've heard, because if you've got a, a roadway where you've got a curve coming up towards the driver feedback sign, it's only going to pick up the car once or twice. Whereas if you've got a long straight roadway, it picks it up multiple times as it comes up. Right. And then that's all the good stuff that the, uh, the radar manufacturers provide about setting up and making sure that if it's pointing the right way to hit the road that they're trying to hit. Perfect. What I'd like to do is, is we're going to swap a camera view. I'm going to come behind you, Drew, and maybe you can show us how we actually wire up to connect into one of the signs. Um, actually, you've got one of the cables here. Maybe you want to just pull that out and show the, show the audience um, what that is. Uh, what we've got here is basically is, uh, and once again, uh, if I know Carmona might be listening, forgive us. We, we call this the IDC retrofit kit. And what we have here is actually a metal back plate that we can mount the, the 0702 and then that actually fits inside the uh, speed check signs. There's actually room in there. Um, and then we actually connect and install to the rest of the sign in there. For AC instead. For AC, well, or yeah. for the DC. Um, in some cases, people like to mount it uh, in the normal cabinet that goes along because getting into the signs and mounting it. My recommendation is mounted in a cabinet if you have a cabinet because it is a hell of a lot easier to maintain. Correct. It's in a perfect world that you just put it in there and walk away, but uh, none of us live there yet. <laughs> um, another thing is we have for this is we worked with IDC to come up with the, uh, the cable. And we got back. The four pin connects to the 070, but we have the, the 10 pin uh, connector there that allows us to connect straight into the sign uh, to make it easier so there's no splicing, there's no cutting, there's no uh, on-site kind of modifying of the cables. You just plug and plug and go. Perfect. I'm going to go grab the little mobile camera here. And Jessica, if you can confirm you can see us and hear us, that would be That's awesome. Correct. We can see Drew's face. Perfect. All right. Uh, Drew, you want to walk us around and show us um, uh, some of the stuff with the school zones, but mainly on, on the driver feedback? Sure, yeah. We can start off with this is uh, these are what we have for our training units, actually. Uh, but this is a solar 
system. We have our sun saver. We have our DC flashing unit. Here's our terminal strip for hooking everything up. Of course, the 070 uh, and a surge protector. And since this is a training unit, we're just using some nice little 12 volt lamps. And then uh, here's our quote unquote system voltage, the batteries. And then on the back side here, we have just a little pack of a power supply to be our solar panel. And that is the GPS antenna and cell antenna? Correct. That is what is referred to as the K cup. Okay, and then inside of this unit as well, just so that everybody can see, we've got a battery in here so we can determine if they're power failures for an AC solution. This is the cell modem over here. This is the processor as well. So the same unit can do both AC and can do uh, DC inputs. Uh, and this is why we can actually swap out the cell modems from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, and so on. All right, in our next example, we have an AC unit. Uh, very similar. We've got uh, basically our um, AC coming in. We have a surge arrestor. We have a 204 flasher. Uh, we've split this to make it a little easier to fit for the, of course, for the back plate for the 204 flasher. Our terminal strips in two places, but AC lamps, and once again, our, our K cup. All right, and those are all connected up onto the back wall there as well. All right, let's go and look at the radar and, and tell us what's different. Uh, for the most part, everything is similar. We have a sun saver. We've got our flasher here. Uh, we've mounted the cake up over here for this example. Terminal strip, your big differences come in where we're actually wiring up the ground, the TX, and the RX. Um, <clears throat> as you most people know with AI, we already have color coded our harnesses. And there's usually a little pigtail one that has a orange, white, and black, and it has a four pin Molex connector that is supplied when you, when you buy the beacons. And this is the case where we're gonna hook it up to our ground, RX, and TX. And then these three cables are what are gonna go actually to the feedback sign. And, okay, so this unit over here, that's a flasher unit. You only need that if you've got a, you only need that if it's going to be a school beacon with a feedback sign. Obviously, if it's just going to be a feedback sign, you don't need the DC flashers. And here's an example of the sign we're actually hooked up to right now. And what kind of sign is that? And this is a traffic comm sign. Um, we've hidden the cables really well. They're going up into the ceiling. And, and their, their device basically has a, also a connector pin that goes into the back. Correct. They they've got a little board computer. They there. have a yeah. They have a little special connection. Um, I can show some of the magic. It's not pretty. Yeah. Uh, here's where you've got our color code coming from our back plate over here, and then here's the wires that we spliced into their cable that actually plugs into their board. But there is actually a cable that you can get that goes from the four pin from our device to their device. I'm not I, sure. I believe it. From okay. from from uh, from them, you can actually okay. get a, a cable. They actually yeah. manufacture one. I'm not sure who has had that cable. We've had that discussion, but they have a different cable than the ten pin, of course, that IDC would use. Yeah, and then who, you mentioned a third supplier of driver feedback signs that we also can connect. And RU two is the third supplier. Uh, there's no quick cables yet for that one. You still have to kind of get your RXs and TXs swapped at the right spot to, to get the comms right. Perfect, perfect. Um, anything that we, in other words, that we're missing on, um, you know, these signs, when, when we do the installs, um, what are, maybe we can go through some of the common issues that we see. Is that something you can take us through? Sure, we can do that. All right, let's, I, I, know, I know you've got a couple of slides that you wanted to talk through, Drew, so. We're gonna walk back to uh, the computer and, and set up those slides so that we can actually see what we're talking about. All 
All right, Drews. You want to take us through some of these? Sure. Um, and, and this was this was information that we got from um, one of the temple technicians in Florida that's installed hundreds and hundreds of these signs, and these were his most common problems that he saw. Right, right, right. Uh, and one of the things uh, that we always made sure of with the instructions was is the first thing is make sure your firmware is correct on both sides. Uh, or otherwise they're not going to talk because they basically have different accents. Um, we worked uh, really diligently with IDC about the control and features to get it working as solidly as they do. Uh, and the biggest thing was is making sure that the speed check sign is on a 4.16 or 4.23 firmware revision. Some of the older ones are quirky and they'll break the, the communication with us a little too soon. Um, all the school beacons out there that we're, that we're making right now are on 2.3.19 version. Uh, a lot of the ones we've got, or most of the ones we've got in the field have been updated, but that's another thing we want to make sure that it's feature rich and complete. Okay. Um, and and, and, and I, I mean, this is obviously, I, I hear about this a lot and I'm sure you hear about this a lot. So this is, a, you know, the serial cables when, um, when they're just not plugged in correctly. Uh, yeah, that was something that we were in discussion about trying to make it a little more um, easy to plug in. And that even though it's a 10 pin header, uh, sometimes you're missing some of the pins. Uh, maybe you're missing half the pins because you're to the right or left and missing a few up and down. Uh, but we, and we try and specify the strain relief on that IDC cable with the, uh, the black uh, part should be to the left. So that gives you some orientation to make sure that we're getting the pins in the right spot. And that's probably the most common thing we see all the time is on installation issues. That is, whether you're on a ladder or in a bucket, it's, it's never easy to really see, you know, plugging pins in. We've all been there, so. Now you can also uh, purchase these devices new, pre-wired as well. So there, there is another thing that you can do when you get a pre-wired new. Yeah, and in our discussions with Carmana, you know, there is a plan to not have to plug into theirs. They're going to provide a, a, a nice weather tight system that's already done and easier to run and, and just quick quick plug as well. All right, and, and, and this one is something that we, we see happening not, not very often, but mainly we see it when you are dealing with an older legacy IDC sign that's been out there for a long time that you're wanting to install is some of the ones that have their old radar that they, they actually don't even it's an old decatur radar if i remember correctly yeah um they have some of their uh serial ports you know it, it's just because the the hardware is a little bit old you need to get a new um a new computer board from Carmana and then that uh you know that you get a bit serial port that works and this was an interesting one that we didn't know about, but apparently it's very, very common. When you have the older uh, signs, uh, especially the, the Carmana signs or IDC signs, um, they had a, uh, you'll see in this picture over here, it's a, a capacitor that was actually connected um, to the terminal strip. And um, you actually need to disconnect this capacitor because sometimes it will overload the um, sun saver uh, and the sun saver stops charging. So you remove the capacitor and everything works correctly. And maybe you want to walk us through this because I didn't know about this and I found out about this when I was hooking up one of these in my home because I've been showcasing all this technology recently from my basement. Uh, and you had to walk me through this process, which I didn't know about. Yeah, the, the Sun Saver actually specifies that you hook up the load first, and then you hook up a battery, the system voltage on the batteries, and then you finally hook up the solar panel. Uh, and if you hook it up in any kind of order other than that, the potential is, is that you're gonna get false readings, like the system voltage is, is not low, or it's not gonna be able to charge properly. Um, so when in doubt, feel free to disconnect 
from the SunSaver and connect in that order of load, battery, solar. All right, what we wanted to do was, um, you know, we, we've got some other stuff that we'll talk about in a second just with uh, some of the connected vehicle aspects behind this. But we wanted to jump into the live system over here, um, which is, this is um, Marietta. And you'll see what we have is we've got a Google map based system. We've got a list of all the intersections and devices. Now they've got a large system here. They've got intersections, they've got emergency vehicles, they've got driver feedback signs, they've got school zones. So they've got so many different types of devices, but because we're using Google Maps, you can uh, basically zoom into any device on the map and actually see what's going on there. So we can go in and um, you know, zoom in and see, hey, there's a driver feedback sign over there and go look at that driver feedback sign. So what will happen is uh, you're seeing all these lines on the map here. That's just from all the vehicles driving around and whether it's uh, the emergency vehicles driving around in an emergency situation or not. This is interesting. Just right next to this device, you'll see that ring around there. Um, and that's showing a fault. So whenever the, and, and it's not a major fault because it's not red. So if any of your devices had a power failure or something like that, it would show a big red ring. If we select on a device here, it's gonna tell us the AC voltage, uh, the monitor battery, the median speed, the 85th percentile speed, uh, the volume and so on. And then you can go and go to more details on this device. And we can see some other information and you'll see the median speed, 85th percentile speed, the volume of the vehicles. And you can get whether or not, you know, this, is, this beacon's always on because this is just the driver feedback sign. Uh, and it's AC. And it's AC. Um, and you can see the minimum the, uh, minimum, the now AC, the minimum, the maximum, the average over the last 24 hours. Um, you can also go in and look at all these reports of these different types of devices. So we can go into the report viewer and I'm gonna open this in a new tab. I like doing this so that you can um, just have two different tabs open. Sometimes it, it just makes navigation that much easier. So we'll go into the feedback signs and we can get uh, you know, that feedback sign report, which was, and this is why I have it in two tabs. The name of this device was Cherokee Street Northbound. So then we can go look at ah, the Cherokee Street Northbound for April or March. So you can look at both of the, the last two months here. And if we look at April, it's gonna show us this information, which gives you, you know, till today, um, averages per day. Um, you can see on the weekends, which are grayed out here, what the averages are and during the week. We have seen a significant reduction in uh, traffic volume, obviously due to um, the situation that we're in at the moment. But this is showing here that we've got, you know, the speeders uh, in the morning, you can see the median speed, then we can see the 85th percentile speed, but you can see where the people are speeding there. And then we can also see the, the volume uh, and how the volume changes to, you know, 15 vehicles per hour at night to, you know, roughly 150 to 200 vehicles during the day. And we get the majority of the, of the people driving um, after lunchtime up until six o'clock in the evening. So, you know, it's great information that's provided here that you can look at and see exactly what's happening within your city. And, and it's quick and easy to see. You know, I mean, this, is, this heat map tells you a story just by looking at it. So you don't have to look through logs and logs of data, um, you know, of what's going on in those different areas. We can also go in and um, look at... For instance, if we want to look at, you know, what's happened on the AC voltages of the beacons. And I love the way that, you know, this is what a normal AC voltage looks like, but we can all see straight away the one that doesn't look right. 
and it looks like a hacksaw. And you can see over here that it's, you know, it's up at 125, 127 volts, dropping down to like 112 volts over here. Interestingly enough, this isn't too bad for school zones, but sometimes when we see that drop down on an intersection, it can cause a traffic signal to go into flash. And that's a critical, a critical problem that happens. So generally, this is due to bad grounding. Am I correct in saying that, Drews? Uh, yes. And, and so what did, what did they do? I mean, Marietta didn't, you know, used to look a lot worse. I mean, they went through a whole process there. Um, of going through all of their intersections and school zones and, and not as much on their school zones, but mainly the intersections to actually redo the grounding. Yeah, and, and they basically use this to take a quick look and see who stuck out and address those issues. And you can see the majority of theirs all look good. We just found one that jumped out of there that doesn't look like it's um, got the best uh, AC voltage coming in. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of information available and, you know, on the beacons as well, we can also look at the beacon health report, um, which will show you any beacons, their batteries that have failed or about to fail. So this is showing you, and this is the report that people use all the time. Um, because the worst thing you can do is have batteries sitting on a shelf uh, in your office, just waiting there because, well, batteries lose their voltage and they die. You know, it's the worst thing you can do. So when you see something going into the fair state, that means it hasn't failed yet, but it's about to fail uh, in a week or two's time. So you can order some batteries and then you're gonna see it either when it goes into fair and you see the, the voltage starting to drop, you can replace it uh, or like this one that says bad, you should replace it now because there's a chance the beacons aren't even turning on because it's 11.4 volts. And there's a specific cutoff uh, on the sun saver that will stop turning beacons on and off. I might somewhere around 11.3 or 11.4 volts. I can't remember the, the value on that. Um, yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a pattern you'll be able to see because you'll see the device will go offline because when the flashers, when we turn the flashers on, we've now sucked the, the last bit of life out of those batteries that are so low that everything just dies. And then after it charges enough, then you'll see come and it'll work fine in the afternoon because it's had all day to charge up. And that's significant of a bad battery, but a good solar power, a solar panel then because... Yes the batteries are just hanging on to their last legs Correct. and they just can't store the charge of energy. And there was no charge overnight. So that's why the batteries, the, your batteries will dip overnight. And then of course, if they're on that, that cusp right there, that first turn on for arrival in the morning will definitely kill them and turn everything off in the unit. And one of the things that I find is, you know, often, uh, and, and is you will, you will find out, um, that you've got a lot of, um, beacons, batteries, when you install our system, because it's now monitoring it, you'll know about the problem sooner. And that's what happened in Marietta, uh, not Marietta, uh, Gwinnett County, where they went and installed the system and they left it running for a couple of days and then they found out which batteries we actually needed to replace. So they used it as a first to monitor everything. So they installed everything in the summertime, looked at all of the battery health and then figured out intelligently which batteries to replace instead of just going wholesale and replacing all their batteries. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, it, you know, artificial intelligence built into, built into these systems. When we go, I uh, should have stayed clicked on that um, unit uh, because what I wanted to show was some of the configuration items we can uh, change on this. So when we go to more details, there's an edit page. Um, now, we, this is just a driver feedback sign, so you don't get to edit everything, and I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. So we've got a scheduling tab. Generally, this is used for um, school beacons where, or a driver feedback sign that's in a school zone that you're changing the speed limits uh, on, a, on a time basis. We also have- 
And I just want to touch on one aspect here, Peter. Um, to save some of the juice of the system, we, in Marietta, they actually have a solar schedule. So from 11 p.m. until about 5 a.m., they actually turn the display off on the sign. So even though people are driving by it, the, dis the sign's not displaying anything, which saves some, some power to keep it going since it is a solar instead of AC. That's interesting. I, something I learned new today. Thank you, Drews. Um, so we have holidays and exceptions that are split out from the school zones because uh, your, your holidays and exceptions uh, change every year. Generally, your start and stop times of the schools remain the same. So the only thing you ever really need to change are, are the holidays and exceptions. Now, one thing I do want to note is uh, there's a scenario tab here that we've used in multiple different places because um, of the coronavirus, where schools got canceled. And what we did was we created a scenario that turned off all the beacons and then they can turn it all back on when school comes back into session. Now, the, there's a program delay. This is designed for hurricanes, snow days, where you want to delay the start time of school zones, generally speaking, um, where you can you know, delay the start time in the morning, uh, or you can, um, instead of delaying it, you can turn the beacons off for tomorrow in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, or you could do early release if you know the storm is coming, ah. doing it in advance uh, instead of having to go through and change them all to a half day schedule all of a sudden. You can put in there and say, hey, we want to get out early because the storm is coming or there's inclement weather. So you can turn, you know, create a new one over here, hit select all or select all of your different beacons um, and then implement it. And then the following day, it'll just run back on its normal schedule. Correct. And then uh, this is the tab um, that gets changed quite a bit. So on the radar signs. So, and I'm going to come back to speed offset in a second. So we've got sign mode, always on, on with beacons. That's generally for a school zone area or always off or otherwise called stealth mode. We've got the speed limit of that area. We've got the steady speed when we start showing you your speed. We've got the flash speed when they start flashing your speed. We've got the slow down speed, which is when the message slow down comes up. And we've got the maximum speed, which is the when we stop showing your speed. Speed offset is a really interesting one, is when you're in a school zone, your speed limit generally changes. So you will have a speed limit when school's in session of 25 miles an hour and when school's not in session of 35 miles an hour along the roadway. So what we do is we dynamically change the steady speed, flash speed, slow down speed by 10 miles an hour. So we would select 10 over here so when the beacons turn on, uh, the, actually the way it works is it adds, it adds 10 miles an hour. So you select your speeds for uh, the actual school limit speeds, and then it will add 10 miles an hour onto each of these. So um, your you know, steady speed would uh, be, you know, this would generally be lower, but it'll be 25 miles an hour your flash speed will be 51 miles an hour, slow down 56 miles an hour, and it'll dynamically change the speed limit so that you're not saying slow down to someone in a school zone uh, when it's, um, you know, when, when the guy's driving um, 25 miles an hour and he's driving at the school zone speed limit, um, which is fine, but when someone, is um or, or, or let's say someone's driving at 30 miles an hour in a school zone area where the speed limit's normally 35 it will just show his steady speed but when school's in session it will actually say slow down and flash his speed at them so it's a great way of dynamically creating a school zone area um that you can actually go and um change the speed limits through our unit connected to the radar feedback sign. 
I'm going to stop my, my screen share here and start the video so that I, I saw that there were a number of questions, Jessica, and maybe you can um, direct some of the questions towards us. Yes. So the first question is, if you have a dual flashing beacon and driver feedback sign that need to be turned on and off at the same time, do you need to create separate schedules for each? At the same time, uh, was the question? Yeah, you want it turned on and off at the same time. No, you just have one one schedule uh, yeah. that you create. You'll have one schedule. You'll set the radar to be on with beacon. So when the beacon turns on to flash the, the lamps, that's what will turn the radar sign on as well. Perfect. Um, and then I think this was when you guys were talking about um, IDC and Carmana, and they're asking, are you working with other DFB manufacturers to integrate with their signs, and are you exclusive with Carmana on school zone systems? Um, the answer is, in other words, we'll work with other uh, driver feedback sign manufacturers. Um, we're always interested in integrating. We're an integration company. So if there are other uh, driver feedback signs that, that a city has, the only requirement is we want, we've got to have a technical resource at that company and they've got to want to work with us because we want to, we want to integrate with everything but we need a company that's also willing to work with us so that we can integrate into, into their science. Perfect. And then the last question here is just, do you have any clients in Canada? Yes, we do. Uh, in Canada, we're doing some, um, uh, some work in Hamilton, Ontario. We're doing some work in uh, Quebec City and in, in, in the Quebec area. Uh, we've obviously got uh, multiple different places that, we, that we're doing some work with our partner, Orange Traffic, that's in, in Canada with us. Okay, and it says, for school zone flashing beacons and some applications that require telltale light on the back of the flashing round amber, can you power them and flash them? Great question. Um, so uh, when you've got a, that would normally end up being, if you're a school zone, you would have a third beacon at the back. Um, what we do is, we, we actually, it's quite clever, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we actually power it through two different relays on our device so that we can actually determine um, whether or not any one of the two lamps on the front has failed because we're monitoring the current through there. And then we're monitoring the current through the second one, through our second relay, so that we can actually determine if any one of those uh, lamps has failed. Um, I think recently we did some stuff in Texas where we were monitoring like up to six or something like that. Lamps. Yeah, we've, uh, we've been doing some work. So in theory with some uh, the newer hardware right now, uh, we can actually monitor four lamps per relay instead of just the two that we have been doing. Uh, it was Text. San Antonio or the city of San Antonio. I keep getting those two confused because they're San Antonio. Um, but we did some work on there to be able to monitor. They've got all three lamps on one relay because of the way they've got it wired. Uh, but yeah, Texas, if I remember right, is the most common place where we have the tattletale tail light. And we've had the configuration, we, we call it a three lamp LOD, of course, unit. And we've had that configuration in the field for several years now. Okay, I think that is all for now. All right, well, um, I want to thank everybody. I think we're actually going to finish uh, five minutes early. I thought there would be a couple more questions. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, chat them in. We'll, we'll wait online for just a little longer. And um, really appreciate everybody that's joined us today. Um, and thank you so much, Drews, for joining me with and um, spreading your knowledge on, uh, on driving feedback signs. No problem. Thank you, Peter. And of course, Thank you for everyone behind the scenes. You know who I'm talking to there, Jessica. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, please reach out to any of us uh, in terms of if you've got any other questions. And, um, you know, we would love to 
um, or oh, actually wait, uh, Jessica, there are, there are a couple of um, questions. Are there any questions in the chat or are we good on that side, Jessica? We are, well, this one is more about the 5G, about it being near school children. Um, I don't know if you want to address that in this one since it's not about driver feedback signs. Yeah, we don't do 5G at all uh, on our devices. We've only got 4G on, on our units. So there is no 5G on, on our units at the moment. Only, okay. 4, only 4G. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back soon.